Hi, I'm Melanie. I work at Microsoft, and my job is contributing to Postgres, but I'm not a Postgres committer, which means that my code can't go directly into Postgres. So what I wanted to talk to all of you about today was some of the things I've learned in the past few years about trying to make my code committable, basically, and the journey from when you write a patch to writing something that can actually go into Postgres. I think there are three areas that I want to focus on, and um, obviously you would write the code first, but we're going to talk about communication and collaboration and presenting your ideas first. And then exercising your code, which includes you know, tests, benchmarks, and basic usage examples. And I'll, I have a lot of um, examples from the PG SQL Hackers mailing list to give you kind of like specifics. So just terminology-wise, when I say patch, I'm talking about a single commit and patch set, multiple commits, and like maybe what you would have is like a, feature, a branch of Postgres that you're developing on. And when I talk about the mailing list and most of my examples, I'm talking about the PG SQL hackers mailing list for the most part. And you can also ask questions. Small group, intimate environment, feel free to interrupt me. So, um, so this was three years ago. I, I've worked on Postgres on and off, but only full time for the past couple years. So three years ago was my, the first attempt at writing an actual full feature. And it was, um, it was actually a, technically a bug fix, but it was ended up being a pretty large project that had to do with um, making hash join do basically nested loop hash join uh, in process smaller batches. And so I spent a long time just figuring out how the hash join code worked and getting something to that actually you know solved the problems and then making the code better and whatever. And I was just looking back at that uh, that thread. And even though you know, on the mailing list, I definitely described the design and did all some of the other things I'm going to talk about. The final patch, the last version from like August of 2020, was one commit, and it was giant. <laughs> and it was actually like just size-wise, the patch was 260k. So uh, this is an email from a recent attempt to like revive the bug fix because it's still an issue that people have. Um, and Thomas Vondrum was like. I mean, this might be the right fix, but that patch is giant. I'm not going to look at that. <laughs> and I think that's very valid, right? And I think it's normal for us to think that when we're done writing the code, that like people should just be happy to receive it. Like, thank you for doing that for me. Um, but the reality is that there are only so many committers that are writing their own features and trying to respond to contributors. And the closer that you can get your patch to being able to be committed, the more likely it is to go in. Um, so starting with communication and collaboration, this is basically just about the mailing list. Um, there's also, I guess, at conferences promoting your work and going around and talking about it. But this is I'm just talking about the mailing list here. So the high-level structure of initial emails that I've thought were good basically breaks down into a couple parts. You have the high-level summary, and then you have to kind of make the case for why the feature uh, or bug fix or whatever it is is a good idea, and why should you implement it that way, the design and implementation details, and then a call to action for the other uh, readers or reviewers. So this is an example of just a recent one because I... Uh, it came up. So this is uh, uh, Thomas Monroe has been working on a feature to do um, streaming I/O, and like the high-level summary, I thought was good here because with the high-level summary, you think of it as just high-level points. But because this is a development mailing list, like it's also okay to provide a little taste of the implementation or the technical sort of underpinnings in the high-level summary. So I think this is an interesting hybrid because it might be different from what you would do in the high-level or executive summary of an academic paper or a much longer design document. It's giving enough details for people to not say, I'm going to have to read a super long email to get to the point. So I thought this was an interesting example where it's saying, like, why we should do this and also a little bit of details about the technical um, implementation. Uh, this one, I think, it, yeah, this is from uh, Thomas Vondra's index prefetching thread that was recent. And so I wanted to, he has sections. So you can actually like outline different sections like motivation and implementation and design and results. Um, but 
the important thing here is that you need to make people care. So is this a feature that users have been wanting for decades and we just haven't you know, done it yet and then you finally cracked the code and figured out how to do it? Is it something that is going to improve performance? And if so, like how, you know, in what way, how, for who? And also like why now? So has something changed such that it's now possible to implement this feature. There is a new syscall introduced, and so now we can uh, actually finally do this on this platform, and that means that we can implement it in general. Um, and then when you're talking about design, I think that the interesting part here is if you're a developer in another environment, you might have experience with writing design documents, and that's kind of not a totally transferable skill here because what's expected is to be pretty concise. Like, it's pretty different than laying out all the details of a design document that someone could take and implement. So the ones that I've thought are good or that I've enjoyed, uh, or that were effective, are pretty brief. And so the points that you bring up, it's important to, like, think about what's actually important to bring up in, when you're talking about the design. And then I think another part is, you have to anticipate the questions that people are going to have. Is the first question going to be, does this work with partition tables? Why didn't you implement it for that? You know, thinking, anticipating the kinds of questions that people ha will come up with. I think this one is, uh, I like, I picked this sample because it also brings up something that other people have told me, which is, why not use some other more obvious design? So I think the second paragraph, it says, why not just do it from the B tree code? Not and I think that's another thing that comes up. It is important to be like, I actually understand the system enough and understand what's going on to have thought of other more obvious implementations and discarded them because I investigated it or I figured out that wasn't the right way to do it. And all of this sounds like a lot of work, obviously, but I think the point is like, you will have gone through these steps anyway. So thinking about how to communicate them is worth your time because for all the time that you spent writing the code, if no one looks at it and they have a lot of unanswered questions, then all of that time is wasted. And then I think the section, the call to action section is important. So this is outstanding to do's, things that you didn't do yet, um, open questions, and for the most part, you're not going to present a totally final product in the first email. If you do, you've probably wasted a lot of time because there are parts of whatever it is that you're developing where people are going to want you to implement it in a different way. So like if there if you have sort of like if you haven't implemented something for certain parts of the system and you can and you know how, it's important to say, I haven't done this because I want to validate the core idea before I do that. Or I'm not sure if this or this design is better for extending my implementation to cover these cases. And so it's a delicate balance to be like, how much of a prototype is worth sharing and how much should I actually implement? But I think like you have to think of it from the perspective of uh, like what can, you want the actual code that you are sharing to be readable and good and people look at it and can understand it. So if that it comes at the expense of implementing and covering some other case, I think generally that's probably preferable. And then you can also ask questions. So the idea here is to like, you know, crowdsource and have other developers help unblock you and um, figure out things that you found confusing. Like this is where you get to do the collaboration aspect. Um, these are like assorted tips, basically, and uh, I'm not really good at the last one, but ideally, if you chime in on other threads and review other patches that are in that subject area, those people will like you more and like chime in on your thread, but I don't know, easier said than done. Uh, and then, like, so if you're doing something that has user surface area and there, uh, there are users that might be interested, getting them, like, copy them on the email and, you know, talk to them and say, you know, off list and be like, hey, do you, what do you think of this? Would you use this? And just getting more of that input sooner before you have a super polished product is helpful. And another thing I think is useful is like, if you're writing a feature where you add some new API or you modify code that there are sort of people that historically in the past have worked on that area of the code base, like you can copy them on the email and they're more likely to feel targeted and respond, at least usually. So you can just like get blame and say like, who's worked on this file? What are these, you know? 
Um, and it's a good way to sort of try to convince people to, to care about what you're doing and to say, I care about your opinion. Um, and then I think this one's sort of general, but like you're reading, someone's reading a plain text email and you, they have to decide whether or not they're gonna keep reading at every moment. So if you highlight and make everything important, equally important, no one's gonna really follow. Um, and then once, so now you've like sent your great initial email and you're responding to review feedback. And I think the important things are that you should answer the questions that reviewers ask you. So if you have only addressed one of the review feedbacks and you send a new version, first of all, it's kind of hard to keep track. Okay, which things are unaddressed, which things are addressed. Like for the reviewer, you're putting the burden on them to be like, well, did you answer the 10 things from these six different threads or responses or replies above this? And it's like your responsibility as the, the, pers the author of the patch set to keep the status consistent and say, okay, like I've addressed these different things. I, these are the ones I haven't because I'm not sure. And so summarizing the current state and what you've done in each new version and then responding to each comment in line is helpful. And it also, I mean, it, it makes it easier if someone is gonna pick it up who hasn't been involved in the thread to know if they're actually providing new, interesting you know, feedback to you. Uh, also, like I would say, just if someone makes a suggestion, like especially someone who might commit your patch, <laughs> I don't like the, having variables in that order, and like I think they should be alphabetic and not in order of use or whatever. Like just do it. I mean, it it doesn't really like s deciding that you don't want to be flexible on small things in your patch is a good way to just have it be a, go nowhere. Um, and if there's points that come out and people say, this seems like a separate issue, you can always start new threads, and that's a way to try to winnow and keep focused on the main topic. Okay, so when you develop a feature and you wanna share it with other people, no matter what, there should be some way for the reviewer to exercise your code. Um, and that isn't like, that can be a couple lines in the email, that's here's how do you use this. That can be, I mean, you should probably have that always, but then you can also, you also may need to add tests. You may need to provide benchmark results depending on what the patch is doing. But I think like the most basic thing in that email that we just talked about writing, there should be something that's short enough to fit in a couple lines, and not every feature, but a lot of times, like that someone can just run and they can say, oh, okay, and then you make the claim, this used to run in one second with my patch and it runs in half a second or whatever. And this helps people to stay engaged and not have to be like, oh, I have to think of a case myself about how, you know, to test this. And this is with something that, this was Robert's incremental backup patch recently. And these like, it's short, right? You can find the usage. How do I use this? How do I see if it works? And it's just there. And I think that's really important because otherwise you're, you're putting the burden on the other person to think about how to use it. Um, so I mentioned benchmarking. In this, I don't just mean like literally benchmarks, I mean performance testing in general. So why would you do that? So if it's a performance feature, it's useful to do that. But also if you have a feature that is not a performance feature, you may need to provide proof that it doesn't prove to be a serious performance regression, right? So um, I would say that less is more. So this is basically like, you don't have to run TPCDS and be like, look, this is X amount faster or whatever. Like the le there's kind of two angles. One is that you wanna provide the most minimal, minimum amount of information that's useful and meaningful and understandable as quickly as possible. But you also have to think about, you want, your prob you want to be solving a realistic problem. So I think you kind of have to look at both parts. One is, this is the, the minimum you need to know to know what the performance results are, and the other is, and this is a realistic world, you know, realistic world case. So I think uh, generally, like, it's really annoying when people attach bash scripts for their benchmark. I mean, not annoying, but like, not people, I never, I never look at those. I don't know, some people probably do, but attachments and things like that. Like, just being able to have something that can be put in line in the email um, is preferable. And there are exceptions, which I will talk about. But 
You also don't want it to take forever to run. So if you're like, hey, run this, and you need to insert 10 gigs of data, uh, people probably won't do that. I mean, I wouldn't do that. Uh, and then like, ex you want to, uh, so like eliminate extraneous requirements. So if you're like, okay, make this table, it has gonna have 10 columns, I have a custom data type you're gonna make, and then one of the columns is that data type, and then there's partitions, and you have all these things, like, and those, I mean, it's this minimal repro stuff, right? Like, you don't want that because then people are not even gonna know which part is the performance improvement part. So there's development gucks you can use, there's table options, you can do a table option, like, you know, turn auto vacuum off, or you can, like, you know, set parallel startup cost or whatever that guck is to zero. Like, there's things you can do to make it so that a small example will work and show your improvement. Um, and then when you're benchmarking, like, so I, I didn't talk about PG Bench yet, but PG Bench is sort of the common language of Postgres developers. So if you can do your test or run your performance example without PG Bench and just put timing on and you see, oh, timing's faster, that's great. But if you need something a little more complicated, like you have uh, written a feature that really needs to be observed with m either multiple connections or over the course of multiple transactions or whatever it is, like a lot of times you might want to use PG Bench. And it's also, PG Bench gives you output that tells you the performance. It gives you the TPS, it gives you like information that you would need to show people the results. Um, so you can use the built, PG Bench has built-in scripts and a lot of people use those, but lots of features are not exercised by the built-in scripts. So like if you're making a copy improvement, you can still use PG Bench with a custom script and it doesn't have to be, you don't have to have a separate script file, like you can even do it in line. And the cool thing about using PG Bench when you're talking about performance results is that other developers know how to use PG Bench. They know what it means. If you're using a built-in script, they know what the default schema is. So you don't have to say as much. A lot of it is sort of implied. And then with reproducibility, what I mean is not just like, oh, run it a couple times and average the results. I also mean like, were there conditions that you were true when you ran this and you're not sure whether or not you have to do that series of steps or not to like make sure that you're able to uh, reproduce it and under what conditions, which is kind of speaks to this, which is like, it's okay if people need to do a couple of steps to reproduce your results. So maybe they need to have shared buffers a certain size, Maybe they uh, need to have a certain amount of data and the proportion of the data size to share buffer size is a certain way. Maybe they need to set certain gucks. Maybe they need to like init DB right before or not do that or whatever. And you can just kind of explain that. And um, also it's okay if you, they need to, you know, obviously like providing the schema and data is helpful. Um, so this is an example from Andres's extent, uh, relation extension scalability patch set. And he just provides the DDL and then something that will generate the data for you and then copy, which means you can just like copy paste, which is pretty much the only way that anyone will actually do it, right? If they can copy paste. Um, and then he also mentions a couple of the, the preconditions between every test, I truncate table and then do a checkpoint. Um, and then this is a uh, old patch that Tom, of Thomas Vondras, I think. I don't know who originally wrote it. Um, and I thought I like this because he talks about the some of the other conditions about the environment are important. So, are there like OS settings that you need to have set? Is it does it differ from architecture to architecture? Like that's okay if your patch is testing something for which there are preconditions, but you just have to be explicit about it. And you don't want to paste like everything, you know, just like cat one of the informational files and put everything in there. You want to meaningfully summarize it and focus on just the parts that are important. And next one. This is going back to the idea of having a realistic use case. So most of what I just talked about was minimizing the amount of information that you're providing to the reader. But if, like, we don't want, you want to convince people that what your improvement does is not just solve a, something in a contrived, isolated situation. So how do you actually explain realistic uh, use cases when they're more complicated and they have more data and, you know, like you, someone wouldn't be able to just copy paste the code and run. You can do it qualitatively. You can be like, you know, sort of this is the real world scenario and give people an idea of what the impact would be. How many people would this impact? And 
you know, I think it's important to also outline the worst. So outline the worst and best cases. So this would put the worst case, this would perform the worst in this situation. And how common is that? And I mean, ideally, the best case is very common and the worst case would never happen or barely ever happen, right? So you want to sort of like make that clear. And then also there are things like other subsystems in Postgres. So how does, does throughput go down after seven, you know, seven hours running full blast or whatever? Like give some information about other investigation that you have done to prove that you know that this will work for real Postgres users. Um, so this is about the literal, like, what results you, uh, how you present the results themselves. So TPS is not the only metric that we care about. There's lots of others. So you have to think about what's the relevant metric for your specific feature or bug fix or whatever. So that can be a plan diff from, you know, from explain output. That can be you did a, perf, a profile with perf and the, some limited summary from that. It can be like the P99 latency, and you can calculate that and just show that. It could be memory utilization or statistics about, you know, IO utilization or whatever. But, like, you shouldn't just show TPS if that's not the main benefit that your patch has. So I think this is from the index prefetching patch. Yeah, so this is just an example. It's just the runtime, and then it's comparing uh, with B-Tree master versus patched, and then comparing with that number of rows, sequential scan and bitmap scan. And it's actually like pretty small, it fits in the email, it's easy to see, but it's actually presenting a lot of information at the same time. And um, this is an example of a patch that ha of Andres's from a while ago that has something to do with memory management something something, I don't even remember anymore. But the point is that the re it wasn't relevant for this patch to just put TPS, right? So this is giving some information that's specific to what this feature is about memory utilization. And after I did this and then this, this is what it looked like. So I think like you should put a lot of thought into this because this is the reason that someone should commit your patch, right? And I think being thoughtful about that is important. So um, most of the time, hmm, there are lots of things that you can't, we don't add regression tests for. But uh, maybe not lots of things. I'm just giving me a look. But like, you're not always able to add tests for things. So I think that, um, but I would always start with the assumption that you should try to write a test, right? So. Um, as engineers, I think that's generally the plan. Uh, so we have different kinds of, so there's different kinds of tests, right? So something that, if there's a part of your feature that you want to protect future developers from breaking the feature that you wrote, um, we have various regression test suites. So there's the core regression test suite where things are written in SQL. And then if your feature relies on concurrency or it's something that, is uh, exercised by replication or um, whatever. There's the isolation, recovery, and subscriptions for logical replication test suites. And in those cases, you can do things like have multiple Postgres's and the interactions between them. Um, but sometimes there's like a flaky test, something that is an, you can't probably read this, but it's not super important that you can read it for me to explain it. But basically, like an intermittent failure. You have to, it only happens one every 10,000 times on one specific machine, blah, blah, blah. There are, uh, one of the things that you can do is, like, if you can find a way to reproduce it, this is Alexander Lakin, is very kind and does this kind of thing a lot for people, <laughs> uh, comes up with a way to produce an issue that's pretty rare and then explains how he did it, and other people do this also. Um, and the nice, the thing that's useful about this is, one, like, you can validate that the fix actually works before a committer commits it and then, you know, tries to see if it doesn't fail, which is not ideal. But the other thing is it's there for posterity. So in the future, if someone has a similar issue or how did we resolve that or whatever, it's there, it's in the mailing list history. And that gives you sort of like, I, I think it's been very useful for archaeology purposes for people. Um, and the last one is like more rare, I would say. So sometimes there's uh, basically things that are really hard to add a test, uh, but 
being able to validate their correctness is useful for multiple reasons. So for future developers that want to avoid, you know, breaking. So this was a, a debug helper that I wrote. This is not in Postgres, but for a patch I was writing that validates that something particular in pruning is working. And there's there are things like this in the code base that, that are behind uh, deep, only in assert builds, and there's some that are behind custom macros that are even too expensive for people to run run in an assert build. Um, and I would say the purpose, obviously, is future developers don't break whatever this is. I mean, a lot of times when I've written these, I've written them because I had a bug in my code that I couldn't figure out what it was, and then I used developed a function to help me figure out what it was, and then it's like, oh, maybe someone that's reviewing this would want to see that I've encountered this situation, thought about it, and figured out, hey, this actually is correct. <laughs> so it doesn't have to go into Postgres for it to be useful for the reviewer. Okay, so now you have, going back to when you actually developed the code, because this topic is, I would say, like a little more complicated to talk about in a presentation, but you, off, I started with that one giant commit in that example, right? And that was a couple years ago. I never, I didn't keep working on that, but uh, recently I've started this, a couple months ago I started a project to try to reduce the amount of wall produced uh, by, vacuum for each block. And so in July, well, it took me, I worked up for like June and July on actually making it work. And I was, this is old, that's a very limited use case that it did the 50% thing, but I was excited to put that up there. Anyway, so it worked and I was like, this code is great. It's awesome. I feel really good about this. This is, I, I feel like I, this is going to be done in a couple weeks, less than a couple weeks, pro probably. And um, uh, yeah, it was really big. Of course, in this example, I didn't even write a commit message for this. But no one's ever going to look at that. Also, it modifies a bunch of scary files if you're looking at that file list. So uh, yeah, it's, it's not going to happen, right? So this was the beginning of a long journey. and. When you talk about splitting up projects or like, so there's two things. One is a project into sub-projects, each of which can be proposed. And the other is for those sub-projects, splitting those sub-projects up into smaller commits. This is the thing that most recently I've been trying to learn and have been asking for uh, feedback on and have been like, I think it, it's something that didn't even really occur to me before, you know? So the, the principles that I, kind of, uh, when I sat down and thought about what are the principles that people that give me feedback on how to improve my code in this way have highlighted, it's these. And I'm, on, I'm gonna speak to each one of them individually, but I wanna start with something that a couple people have told me is surprising about Postgres, which is that every commit that goes into master is supposed to work. It's supposed to compile and pass tests and like someone should be able to run a, it on their machine and like do everything and it just works. Um, I mean, we don't call every commit releasable, but it's supposed to work and it's not supposed to fail in the build farm. Obviously it's a development branch, so stuff does, but like you can't, when, it, when you're splitting your commits up, say, okay, well, I wanted to split them up because these two things are functionally separate, but this one doesn't compile and this one does. Like that, that's not a valid way to split up commits when you're developing. So this was my first attempt to split this up. Uh, the top one that says freeze while pruning has 85 or 90% of the diff. <laughs> so it wasn't a great uh, attempt. It did not actually make it very much more reviewable. And a lot of these had issues. Um, so I'm going to talk about a couple of the commits that I think were particularly bad or whatever had issues. So one of them was pass off look from on access pruning. So this, uh, I think before I talk about the bad commit message, I'll just mention that. So this, I proposed this as part of another patch that was, I'm gonna talk about later. But uh, Robert Haas pointed out that this, basically what this does is there's a function and the parameter was optional. So we had a bunch of if statements checking if it was null. And then I thought that was super annoying because there was no reason that the two callers that the one that didn't could just not pass null. Um, so 
it seemed like a small change and it made refactoring nicer. And he was like, but it's not worth it. So every commit, I mean, not every committer is looking at every commit, but it, it, every time that you change code and touch code, it's introducing churn. So whether that's BitRot and other people's branches that they're developing, or I think probably more importantly, it's, give, it's cognitive overhead for committers because they're responsible for maintaining it. So if it's not adding a meaningful benefit of some kind, asking them to commit that and then everybody else to basically agree this is not risky or whatever, like it takes whatever it is, if it's five minutes of everyone's time, like then the benefit has to be more than five minutes of 30 some people's time, basically. Um, so one of the suggestions that Robert had was that, so what this, this parameter was used for, it's the offset of a, uh, of a tuple. And in vacuum, there's an error callback mechanism. And then when you get a um, message, like a, when you have an error, the detail has the tuple offset in it. And so when you're doing hot pruning, you don't have that. It was, doesn't pass the offset in. And he was like, we could add that for on access pruning. There's no reason that we couldn't. I mean, it's, I didn't do this because it was gonna be a lot more work, um, but like I'm intending to at some point, just didn't make the top of my list. But I think that it's valid because here is like actually something that users or other developers would get something out of this, so it would make it worth it. And so it's just about balancing risk and reward, I guess. And then back to the, uh, the commit message. So. I mean, it's, I think his point was that the commit message, the, the title of the commit message also, doesn't actually say, doesn't give you any indication of if, if this is something that is, matters. Like, is it, like, it doesn't actually give you any information other than literally functionally, like, what it does. So I rewrote it, and I, actually no one has looked at this, so I don't know if this is better, but the, I think it, communicates more clearly what is being done. I think the word require and uh, is more helpful than pass, and it's more descriptive. And then it gives enough details where someone doesn't have to look at the code to know what it's doing. I think that's kind of the point. Um, so this is another uh, commit from this, from the initial split I showed you. And um, this is the only thing from that patch set that's gone into master. And I think one of the things that's interesting here is that there were two things that this commit initially did that were both not very many lines of code. And one of them was I needed some parameters that were available in one function higher up the stack, and so I made a struct and took the parameters and also some others that were around that seemed relevant and put them in that struct. And I put that in the same commit as removing this visibility check because it wasn't very many lines of code. The, the reason I needed it was as part of removing this visibility check. But the reason not to do that in the same commit is that every like, line of a diff, you should be able to look at it and associate it and say, from the commit message, every line of the diff makes sense right away, and I see how it's related. And like putting those parameters in that struct and initializing them and all of that, it's not clear what that has to do with something that objectively looks kind of scary, like deleting that visibility check, deciding if that's correct or not is its own like cognitive overhead. So com putting that in the same patch is doing something else that is just moving some things around that would work without removing that makes it more difficult for the reader to know if it's correct. And so in the end, this was separated into two commits, and one did, I think the comments plus the commit message are probably longer than the diff, but <laughs> uh, yeah. And then one other example, something that wasn't intuitive for me at first, but then later I feel like makes a ton of sense is, so as part of this, I was trying to combine the visibility record, the prune record, and the freeze record, into one, and there were things that were happening that needed to be moved, but also there was pieces of code that would be better if they were combined and would be easier for me to use. I needed to do part of it before another part. So I ended up relocating it and rearranging all of the code at the same time. So then when you look at the diff, you see, 
okay, here's like a bunch of lines deleted. And then you look, okay, where did they go? But they're also different. So like that, when uh, someone was reviewing it and looking at it, they were like, you shouldn't do that. You should rearrange it in place if you're able to, if it's functionally correct to do that. And then in a separate commit, even if this isn't how it goes into Postgres, like for the purpose of the reviewer, then separately move it. And that allows the, the reviewer to determine if it's, first of all, if the rearranging is correct. And then moving it's trivial, right? Like, oh yeah, you took these and put them over here. Um, and then the last one, I think this is like a matter of opinion, like opinion, I don't, I don't think everyone thinks this, but I, some, I think the less lines of diff that you have, the better. So something like introducing new functions in an API or adding a new API, a lot of times it can be helpful to introduce that first and then not put it in the same commit as its first usage. And there's people that feel the exact opposite. So I'm just saying, in my opinion, the fewer lines that you have in a given commit, the more likely people are to read it and also be willing to vouch for it and be willing to commit it. Like from talking to committers, my I mean, they're like going to be on the hook for the rest of their lives, right, for that code that they commit. So uh, that's scary. And I think what you want to do is make them feel as safe as possible <laughs> in being on the hook for it for the rest of their lives. Uh, and then I'm not going to go into separating projects into sub-projects, but I think this is an important topic. I couldn't really talk about it without getting into the implementation details of the patch that I was talking about. But basically, the idea behind this is, outside of just separating things into separate commits, if you can actually pull out separate topics that have their own performance benefit or benefit Postgres in some way and make those separate threads, you're way more likely to make progress. So the goal is, if you have this bigger project in the end, everything needs to be shaped like this. You just try to move the code in that direction over time with a series of smaller painful projects. And then like, by the end of that, maybe the code is in a state where the thing you actually meant to do is possible. And that is, I think it's not just because that's the only way to do it and it makes it easier for everyone, but also then you kind of feel a little bit better about yourself because you've done something instead of working on something for two years and then none of it's in Postgres. So it kind of is for everyone, not just for the benefit of the committer. Okay, so if you want to talk more about these topics or anything else about Postgres development, I encourage you to attend next year's pgconf.dev in Vancouver. Um, the CFP is open now through January 15th. We would love to get lots of submissions. Um, and if you want to talk to me about what's going to be covered there, it used to be PGCon Ottawa. It's kind of the extension of that or the new version of that if you've been to that in the past. So if you have questions about what it's going to be like, Ask me, ask Jonathan, ask Magnus, anybody else from who are working on the conference. So yeah, anyway, that's it. Do you have any questions? All right, well, thank you. Oh, oh. Uh, thank you, I, I really liked it, I mean, it, it was up to the point and great, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I've did s s different projects. I'm not a Postgres committer, but I was reviewing like 250 kilobyte refactors, and very often I don't see any way to make them smaller. I mean, if you refactor things and you keep the APIs, and even worse, what I did once, I renamed directories and, and files, and the whole structure was different, and then producing separate sub projects on top of this, no way. So frankly, I don't really know how to get this 250 kilobytes I mean, smaller. I mean, you tried, so what's your progress? Do you, even, do you think you ever can manage it? Or? Well, so 250K being big is kind of unfair because like, you could have something that uh, renames a variable throughout the entire code base or what's the thing that Peter did recently with the enums and the comma? Like, I mean, you can have all sorts of commits that do a lot of in this the amount of the diff is large, but like that's different than the actual like complexity, the number of lines of meaningfully different distinct like things, and then that patches thousands of lines. I think those are different. 
I think that's particularly true if you just move code around, that the default diff output is going to give you that as like added and removed lines, but if you look, look at it with git diff in interactive mode, it will just say, say it renamed that file, and you can see with, with a mode called somewhat color moved lines, uh, and then the lines that are moved that didn't change are just a different color, and those you wouldn't count because like whatever, it, it just, it's just move code. And there's still a case where you can't reduce it below that complexity, but uh, you have to justify why that this is one of the few cases where that should be acceptable. And it also depends on the type of project. If it's like you and one other person that's work on it, works on it, it's fine to have a 500 kilobyte patch, but if it's like a project lots of people use, it's different. Uh, um, could the committers raise their hand, please? I have a <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm a Postgres beginner, but I'm re review code in different projects. And one of the worst problems, and Melanie also, I mean, maybe you, you've seen this. How do you review the code which is not in the diff? I mean, to me, the diff-based review is a very limited thing because, for example, it has to be changed also somewhere else when you don't see this. Like, literally, I spend a lot of time figuring out, like, oh, he changed this here, and they changed it here, but actually, they should have also thought of a different pieces, like a clients of this code, maybe. And you miss the pieces if you only look at the diffs. How often do you switch to the full file view and see the full files and think about the whole change? Because to me, it's very difficult with Git. I mean, with just Git diff approach. Thank you. It's easy. You just know everything. <laughs> <laughs> He's not allowed to answer any more questions. Give it to someone else. I mean, I often apply the patch, and, and then, then I use my editor to browse around and look, look around the patch. Uh, one thing I often do, like if you're renaming variables or something, I grab for those variables and see if you missed a, a comment somewhere that you that was being referenced. Happens a lot, uh, stuff like that. I don't think there's any single magic trick. Also, you know, if you're familiar with the code base, you will often just think of places that, you know, uh, it probably also need to be changed. But yeah, grepping helps a lot. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I agree with, with Hagee. Um, one of the tools that I like to use a lot is C-Scope um, in particular because that's going to then, I, I tend to be more kind of text command line based, so using C-Scope to jump around all the different uses of a given variable is, is really handy or a given function or, you know, something like that. You can see all the places that were used and you can see what was changed there, but just like Hickey was saying, it's apply it and then use the tools that are available to look at it, because you can also look at diffs in different ways, right? I, I hate the, the the diff style that you get with, you know, regular Git, right? Um, and so I tend to use uh, uh, an actual diff program instead, right? Because um, you can do unified versus context versus other diff approaches, and so choose the one that, that works for you, right? Um, and you can certainly also change, like, if you want to see more of what's there, if you're doing a like context, if you can actually say, oh, well, show me, show me more lines, right, of, of what the context was around a particular change. So I think that's, you know, those are, those are techniques. I would also put it to, to Melanie. I mean, what would you say? I think this, this was pretty exhaustive. While I have a captive audience of, like, whatever, five committers or something, I would be interested... <laughs> I'd be interested to ask, because no, I haven't presented this to anyone before. These are just my opinions. So I would be interested what you feel like I left out. Also non-committers, but this was mostly about how to make committers commit your code. So I'd be interested what you thought could be added or subtracted. You want to answer? Oh. Okay. I think explaining that you've looked through the archives and found these prior discussions referenced them and say, these were bad ideas, I'm doing something different for a reason. Because like, I don't know, lots of the committees have been around for many years and like remember, hey, there was this discussion. And if you don't actually help them to point towards it, they will often say, oh yeah, I remember this happening and we decided it was a bad idea, but they won't look it up and you won't necessarily 
I've looked yeah. it up so you can't argue about it. Yeah. I had a, actually, I, that was one point that I really wanted to address, but I forgot, which is like, what are all the reasons that it failed? Like, why are all the previous attempts, how, why have all the previous attempts failed? And then citations so that people can look at them. Yeah, totally. So I, I would say maybe a relatively minor thing, but um, one of the things, because I've given talks similar in this vein before, one of the things I like to kind of harp on is, you know, when you're writing code to try to make it look like the code around it, uh, I don't think you mentioned that in, in here, and that's something that, at least for me, I think helps in both the review um, and also just as a, you know, just to kind of keep things sane. Like, if everything's using one case style, don't, like, go change to a different one right in the middle of it, right? We have enough of that already. But, you know, things like that, I think, are typically helpful to, to make the code look like it was all kind of written at one time rather than, you know, chunks changed clearly mm -hmm. in different places. Right. So that would be the only other, Yeah. you know, that was one other thought I had, that's all. Yeah, yeah, cool. Peter's allowed to answer this one if he wants to, not Eisenchat, uh, Gagan. No, Eisenchat is too, but I'm saying, I previously banned him, so I'm Well, thank you, I was gonna sheepishly you. ask if I was allowed to. Yeah, speak. you are, you are. You saved me that trouble. Yeah. Um, you can close the show. Uh, well, that's a lot of pressure. Uh, so I guess, I, perhaps you could have said more about the role of benchmarking in, I mean, it's just, this is an arbitrary thing since you ask. I probably wouldn't have said so otherwise. Uh, you could probably have said more about the role of, of benchmarking in performance validation where you deliberately come up with an adversarial case where you want to make your patch look bad and fail. Because, and it's relevant to the more general point about um, focus in that it's not so much that you're not, you're not so much proving um, that it does any particular thing any particular way so much as, oh, we just don't have to discuss this. This is literally as bad as it, uh, and as it's an adversarial case. It's designed to be, to make your patch look bad and yet it, it doesn't or it barely does. So we can just not talk about that anymore. Right. That's often something that right, is useful. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I think what you said was very valuable and useful. What would be a good way of making this accessible to future contributors so they can follow your guidance? Oh, well, I mean, this is also not guidance. Like, I'm not a committer, so I, like, this was my opinion, but I can put the slides on <laughs> online. And um, I think it's, like, a cool discussion that you can, like, these are points where you can, when you talk to committers, you can ask, what could I have done better in my thread. Like if you have a thread where it didn't go the way you wanted, like you can bring this up when you talk to committers. But I'll put the slides online to answer that specific question. Okay, we have time for maybe one more question or two. Uh, just one more comment on what you could have mentioned. Uh, if you are actually believing strongly in what you did and like some committer says in a like cursory manner, this is a bad idea, goodbye, uh, you might actually be right. <laughs> And sometimes pushing back is okay, but you have to like, you know, try to measure your own confidence and stuff. And yeah, being a pushover doesn't work. Insisting on every, you being right and everything doesn't work. Be reasonable. <laughs> right, last one. Okay, I, I'm always surprised that you think that we know what we're doing. I was, <laughs> like, like I think you can, I think you can go only so far with that. Like I don't know. Is, is often something I say, or you're, sometimes you're surprised that we all contradict each other. Well, of course we all contradict each other. I, mean, I thought that was on purpose, by design. Maybe in my case. <laughs> uh, so, so that's all. And that is all. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>